Hello and welcome to Bharat Shakti dot in. I am Nitin Gokhale. The Indian Coast Guard, one of India's premier border guarding institutions, has been in existence for the last 47 years, and yet very little is known in the public domain about its functioning, about its role, about uh, what it entails to guard India's vast coastline. And to overcome that shortcoming uh, in the general public's mind, I'm joined today by Vijay Safikar, who was uh, additional director general of Coast Guard till very recently after just before he retired and someone who spent decades uh, in the formative years of the Coast Guard. Thank you for your time, uh, Vijay, and uh, uh, welcome to this program, really. Thank you, Nitin. Pleasure and honor talking to you. Uh, let me start with the most obvious question. You know, Coast Guard has been in existence for over uh, 46 years now. And uh, it's, of course, uh, now uh, expanded from its uh, origins, the uh, small beginning of this force uh, in 1978. Uh, but uh, we need to know a little more about the Coast Guard. So if you can give a brief overview of what Coast Guard is and how it was uh, formed, why uh, it is now an important uh, part of India's uh, national security grid. Uh, if you can uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the force itself. Yeah. Uh, having joined Coast Guard in the formative years and having witnessed initial struggles, I remember uh, Coast Guard made the beginning uh, with two old naval frigates, Kuthar and Krupan. And yes, there was also uh, there are two uh, Fokker Friendship F-27 aircrafts on lease from Indian Airlines. So at that time, we rejoiced on little achievements of the Coast Guard. But then soon, long-term Coast Guard perspective plans were made. Coast Guard was progressively strengthened. And as of date, I can say that Coast Guard is transformed into a professional maritime force. And uh, this can be judged from the scale of achievements of the Coast Guard. If you allow me, I can elaborate on Please. few of that. Please do that. Well, uh, initial years when I joined, early 80s, uh, we had this poaching or fishing by foreign fishing vessels happening, not just in territorial waters, but close to our shores. And this activity by foreign fishing vessels was not by the neighboring maritime states, but also for Myanmar, Thailand, and vessels came from as far as uh, Philippines, uh, Thailand, and Korea. So, Coast Guard got after apprehending these vessels, and progressively, huge number of vessels were caught, and uh, this poaching activity or illegal fishing was curbed. And as of date, uh, we can say there is no poaching by foreign fishing vessels, but we have reached this stage after about 1,600 foreign fishing vessels, and which were manned by about 13,500 foreign crew. So all these people were arrested. They were subject to the process of law and thereafter repatriated. So that is how we, we contain this poaching activity. <clears throat> but then you know, during 80s, you would have heard about the silver and gold smuggling and Coast Guard had huge uh, success in anti-smuggling operations. And in late 80s, at one point of time, the total value of catch, that silver and gold catch as Coast Guard had, that nearly exceeded the investment in Coast Guard. So you can understand the kind of success we had at that time. This is mostly on the West Coast Seaboard? The mostly gold on the West Coast. Yes. And then later, major challenge was about piracy. You have heard about the uh, Alondra Rainbow case. Japanese merchant vessel shores taken over by pirates and rescued by the or recovered by Coast Guard. It, in fact, gave Coast Guard international fame. And then in, again in 2010-11, there were reports of piracy taking place in luxury waters. So Coast Guard foiled most of those piracy incidents and uh, apprehended many Somali pilots, pirates. And since then, in the last 11-12 years, there has not been any piracy case reported in Indian waters. But then again, the drug trafficking, anti-drug trafficking operations, there have been a series of them. And in the recent past, almost every month we hear some Coast Guard uh, operation, of, normally off Gujarat coast or in luxury quarter, also they are being taking place in coordination with Sri Lanka and Maldives. Uh, and till date, the value of those truck catches exceeds something like 10,000 crore. So I'm sure this all these operations have been had phenomenal success, and which is in addition to safety of life and property, there is assistance provided to merchant ship, uh, fishermen, cyclone relief, and till the last count, I believe some 11,000 lives were saved out at sea. So that is the scale of 
post guard so operation vast spectrum vast spectrum of uh, activities that uh, post guard does but you know yes. there is confusion amongst uh, common uh, indian citizens that uh, there is the indian navy and there is also the coast guard so how do they uh, function how do they coordinate what are are there overlapping conflicting uh, functions that they have uh, so if you can clarify that what is the mandate for the coast guard indian coast guard uh, what does it have to do what is its jurisdiction up to uh, i think that will help clarify some of these uh, you know, some of the confusion that is there in the minds of the people yes i think uh... question is why coast guard it may sound very basic question in the 47th year but it is very relevant because the way coast guard job is perceived that is coast guard means to guard the coast so people think probably coast guard job will be along the coast or on the coast another thing is coast guard means navy or coast guard is part of navy now reason that this kind of perception exists is that people find it very difficult to comprehend as to what could be that unique specific charter that government of india thought it necessary to create another maritime force now to understand this uh, we have to look at the events of 1960s and 70s and i would sure. say that coast guard owes its existence to those events of 60s and 70s now what was happening uh, in 60s oil exploration activities started in the bombay high and those activities were happening about 100 to 150 kilometers from the coastline now as of that date by government of india notification of 1956 india's territorial waters extended only up to 6 nautical miles that is about 10 kilometers whereas this oil exploration activity was happening about 100 to 150 kilometers so what happened next was through 15 constitution amendment government of india promulgated its jurisdiction on the resources of seabed and continental shelf seaward from our coastline and no outer limit was specified so that is how the oil expression activity in the bombay high was given legal backing but it was happening around the world and the coastal states were making claim over the ocean resources territorial claims and there were conflicting claims in this backdrop united nations sponsored what is called a law of sea conference with a mandate to develop a comprehensive legal framework now this legal framework later became law of sea convention but even before that in 1976 government of india enacted maritime zones of india act proclaiming india's exclusive economic jurisdiction in the maritime zones and this maritime zones extended 200 nautical miles from the coastline and also around the islands and in total measuring over 2 million square kilometers right so we are, here we are in a situation where we have huge national interest economic interest in the this vast ocean, ocean space so we have made a claim over this of jurisdiction but is one thing to make claim jurisdiction another thing to enforce it so the requirement was protect this resources marine maritime resources prevent poaching of this resources facilitate sustainable exploitation of these resources by our fishermen by our uh, oil exploration activity and then protect shipping safe and maritime trade now all these activities were essentially about maritime law enforcement very different from what navy does maritime defense warfare power projection so obviously government of india thought it necessary that we need another agency to carry out these functions and thus indian coast guard was constituted on 1st feb 1977 followed by coast guard act in 1978 which very clearly said what coast guard is supposed to do that is to protect india's national interest in the maritime zones and ensure ease of security so it was a very distinct clear charter for which coast guard was created right so its jurisdiction extends from the shore to about uh, what the territorial waters or it goes beyond 200 nautical miles which is about 360, 360 kilometers in to sea right so uh, having done that uh, and then uh, having got a clear mandate and you have already explained how coast guard has contributed to uh, defense of india in many ways uh, preventing smuggling preventing poaching preventing even uh, drug trafficking but uh, as we see in the 21st century uh, we've had the uh, mumbai attack for instance in 2008 a seaborne uh, terrorist attack uh, which uh, then created uh, again a lot of uh, bad blood between different agencies between government agencies and also there was blame game everywhere since then uh, the coast guard has uh, actually uh, expanded uh, if i can use the word exponentially uh, to my memory uh, after 2008 
and you were i'm sure uh, part of uh, that uh, expansion as uh, middle level and then senior level officer uh, in the coast guard so how has coast guard now uh, got uh, not just an additional uh, manpower additional resources but has also expanded its activities if you can you know elaborate on that a little bit uh, well uh, i think the growth of coast guard which happened with the proper perspective plan and uh, to fulfill the requirement of the coast guard charter the statutory function given in the coast guard act but i would see there are two phases one is pre 2008 and then post 2008 so coast guard definitely started acquisition of ships of different class offshore patrol vessels uh, fast patrol vessels or crafts to reach shallow waters and the aircraft dorniers for the surveillance and the carrying of surveillance and the helicopters so this post uh, structure was already available and was being developed exactly to support the statutory function and charter of course things changed post 2008 and as i mentioned all those accomplishment and achievements of coast guard they become second in the moment we talk about what happened in 2008 uh, mumbai attack but to understand that uh, and it is a legitimate question why did it happen how did it happen and what are we doing about it that it doesn't happen again so we have to look at the uh, maritime domain and challenges of maritime security and first of all is that we have 7516 kilometers coastline then territorial waters 12 miles into sea and beyond that this is head of 2 million square kilometers so all this area has to be kept under surveillance at all times besides this we are endowed with a maritime geography uh, by virtue of which we have huge or major shipping routes and major east west shipping traffic which passes through or in the vicinity of our uh, waters what it means is that at any given time there are thousands of merchant vessels which transit through our eez and add to this uh, we have something like 3 and 1/2 lakh fishing boats registered in india and we take a conservative estimate of say 30% of them that is about 100000 fishing boats out at sea at any given time so that is how dense is a maritime domain so the task is to detect threat from this kind of dense and vast maritime domain, maritime environment now certain things happen post 20 uh, 2011 there is about uh, on at policy front there is a demarcation of responsibilities uh, delegation of responsibility to various agencies navy is overall in charge of maritime security there are joint operations room there are joint uh, sops there are joint exercises and coast guard is in additionally made specifically responsible for security in territorial waters but then uh, for coast guard coastal security is not coastal because you will understand that threat rarely originates in the territorial waters it has to transit through high seas and easy to reach territorial waters so sure. of course the responsibility is for territorial waters but most of the coast guard effort um, i wouldn't say most very large portion of it is focused in the easy in any case coast guard operations are guided by dual uh, objective that is one definitely to deter the threats inimical to inimical to our uh, national security but at the same time reassure reassure the legitimate users of the sea that is to help our fishermen to exploit uh, fish or carry out fishing activity or the oil exploration activity or maritime transport so we have to protect that so this two thing but coming to the deterrence how to deter the forces enemy but as i said there is a challenge about detecting the threat from the, the dense maritime domain what is one thing which has changed in the last 20 years is we have now chain of static sensors along the uh, coastline which is chain of radars which can detect boats of fishing boat at certain distance but then they can detect for physical identification again aerial surveillance or surveillance by physical investigation by ships or aircraft is required now uh, how it is done how we can deter is one of the ways carry out frequent boarding operations and take the probability of detection so high that possibly nobody will attempt another attack like that or try the similar way but it is not going to happen on the same way there are variety of ways in which sure. adversary can think and we also think about it and it, this possibility of simulated cat and, cat and mouse game <laughs> yes so that so that goes on uh, but see security situation may be dynamic but what is constant and uh, is 
the requirement to keep the entire EEZ and territorial water under surveillance at all times, both through electronic medium and visual medium for threat detection. Now, this part is done by uh, having a chain of radars and frequent boarding. But one of the things to create deterrence is not just physical boarding, but also carry out uh, radio telephony investigation, which is done by Coast Guard ships and aircraft, frequently questioning the ships and boat transiting through our EEZ. Now, sometimes it becomes kind of harassment for the merchant ship. They feel oh, just now one Coast Guard ship called, another, after, another is calling, an aircraft is also calling, asking the same information. So there is kind of clutter on radio telephony network. But it helps because it helps to amplify our presence. Mm. Coast Guard is there everywhere. And in sure. fact, this is one area where mm. Coast Guard working is totally different from that of Navy. Or I would rather say it is opposite the way Navy works. Okay. Navy is required to be silent and invisible. Whereas right. visibility is key to our operation. We have to be more and more visible so that we succeed in what we want to do. So Absolutely. Because well, it's law enforcement. Your, your role is, uh, in this case, is law enforcement. Law enforcement and to be visible, both whom you are reassuring for our own right. service and deterrence for both purposes. Visibility. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that is how the things are uh, addressed. As far as you mentioned about the force level change, yes, there has been huge capability development plans which have been supported by government of India. And I'm, I must say, thankful that uh, government has been very kind in providing budgetary support. That is how Coast Guard assets, like if you talk about the aircrafts, we had almost two and a half times increase in the net surveillance capabilities. We have this ALH, we have heard about 16 of those ALH added to the Coast Guard inventory. And this was a long overdue demand for twin engine helicopters, a very important role that way. And coming to the ships, there are larger ships, medium sized ships, and uh, smaller boats and uh, hover crafts. So, the specialized hover crafts, they are covering the shallow waters, which the ships, because of their draft restriction, cannot reach. And then also, we have, uh, yes, an uh, important thing I think I, I, I missed out. What was it? Into, it is not just numbers which are gone. Uh, to 160 from about 65, 70. But what has changed is that before 2008, most of the Coast Guard ships were operated on extended life. That, they, that it was an aging fleet, and because replacement was not coming through quickly, so the life was extended. So now, not only that, we have added numbers. The strength has gone up. All those old ships are replaced. All right. In my understanding. Probably there is no Coast Guard ship due for decommissioning as of date. So we can say there's a brand new fleet, expanded fleet, with state of art technology inducted. Uh, so capability building program has really gone off well. And uh, probably, yes, we can respond much, much better than what we could do then. Sure. So modernization has been one of the key aspects of uh, Coast Guard's growth. Uh, but uh, also, I think Coast Guard has also increased its cooperation with. Uh, nation states around uh, India's uh, periphery as well as in the extended neighborhood. Tell us a little more about that kind of a cooperation that happens because drug trafficking and human trafficking is uh, not uh, one nation's problem. It is becoming a problem for uh, Indian Ocean littoral states, uh, there, there are state island states in India's vicinity and uh, distant uh, or you know long distant uh, illegal fishing which you mentioned in the beginning. All this uh, entails that there has to be more cooperation between different Coast Guards of different countries. How does that work? Yes, uh, as I mentioned uh, on the issue of drug, drug trafficking, definitely there is a close cooperation with Sri Lanka and also Maldives. And we are able to curb and really get up to the drug traffickers in this area because of the cooperation. Where we, we have missed out on the boats of their escape, they have been caught on the other side. So that has worked very well. But on international cooperation part, as I said, uh, those capability building and induction of state of art ships. So you would have heard recently there was news about Coast Guard killing in the Goa shipyard for two pollution control vessels. Now, these sure. two pollution control vessels will be added to already existing three pollution controls which are there with the Coast Guard. And these vessels are uh, well equipped for major oil spill response operation and can act as a command platform in case of a major tanker crude oil spill. Now, people are probably not familiar, but if there is a major tanker accident or oil spill, it can have devastating consequences, not just to marine environment, but to, to the economy of the coastal state. And there have been several examples of that, and there is a regulatory mechanism. It's also capability building program. So, Coast Guard as a 
Central Coordinator for National Oil Spill Disaster, has a huge stockpile of equipment located at Mumbai and Chennai for oil spill response. So also the combined capability of the equipment available with our oil handling companies and this dedicated ocean control vessels. I can say it is one of the very significant capability of the largest in the Indian Ocean region. And uh, there is a regional co cooperation program, in fact, sponsored by UNEP, and a regional agreement concluded amongst the countries of South Asia, uh, under which there is a cross border uh, assistance program. And uh, the significant one, which actually happened, was in, in September 20. There was a major oil tanker, empty blue diamond, which caught in fire. In Sri Lanka, off, yes. off Colombo. Yes, off Colombo. Off Sri Lanka. And it was carrying 2,70,000 tons of oil in on fire, and assistance of Coast Guard was requested. This dedicated pollution control were rushed in, so also the OPVs and other aircraft assistance. And they fought for seven days. The fire was fought for seven days and extinguished. And the Coast Guard role in preventing that disaster was well acknowledged. Uh, so I think this is very significant. So also in search and rescue, our search and rescue region is, which is the area of responsibility for Coast Guard, is almost two and a half times the EZ. That is how big it is. And then it borders several countries in the Indian Ocean. So by virtue of that kind of capability that Coast Guard has, it's a very credible record. I think if anywhere in the seas, any distress alert is raised, it is in auto network. It reaches the respective Coast Guard Rescue Center and Coast Guard has a uh, system under which Rescue Coordination Center, nearest ship is directed or Coast Guard as it is sent. So we can say anywhere in Indian waters, the rescue is assured if there is distress alert. Is. So that kind of effective system is there. And which makes us cooperation with the neighboring country. In fact, recently I understand the Coast Guard Maritime Rescue Center is designated as a focal point for SR coordination amongst IORA countries in the Indian Ocean. So that's very significant. Already we have a MOUs with the several Coast Guards of the world, that is Sri Lanka, that is uh, uh, Korean Coast Guard, Japanese Coast Guard. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think the yeah. role of Coast Guard globally is interesting. It's not only got a vast mandate, it's also got now a very well-developed capability. But before I come to my final question, this one uh, clarification I wanted or one uh, point of uh, information from you, the drug smuggling or narcotic smuggling that happens uh, in mostly in the Arabian Sea and going down towards Lakshadweep and Sri Lanka and Maldives, most of the drugs come from the uh, AFPAC region, the Afghanistan-Pakistan nexus uh, comes in here. Uh, where, yeah. does the, where do the drugs originate? Very true. And uh, the vessels mostly, which are identified, associated with the Iran, Iranian boats. And we know they do visit Pakistani ports before coming into this area. So that nexus definitely is active. And it is very important to crush it because this uh, drug network is also linked to terror financing. So it, it has been taken very seriously. Yes. So my final question to you, since you are uh, at the apex of the uh, Coast Guard uh, organization, uh, one of the key uh, challenges I'm sure uh, you face or uh, the Coast Guard still faces is to get the right manpower and then train them. Uh, how did you manage that or how do uh, how does Coast Guard manage that? Do you get adequate manpower? What are the uh, ways that you train them? And uh, what is the attraction of the Coast Guard service? I think Coast Guard has been uh, able to project itself well. It remains in the news. Probably that's the reason that Coast Guard is able to attract uh, very... Uh, good uh, uh, interest and good response to the Coast Guard advertisement. As far as training is concerned, we've been doing our basic training with Navy and that is the way we've chosen to do it. And so also the initial sea training because that is common for Navy and Coast Guard. And thereafter, this Navy training is shifted to Coast Guard Academy, which is temporary academies in Cochin, but full-fledged academy is uh, the work is in progress in Mangalore. So that is going to be for the specialized Coast Guard roles, whereas the basic training will continue with the Navy. And uh, there are several specialized courses for which Coast Guard officers and sailors go abroad and they get trained, especially with the US Coast Guard and Japan Coast Guard. So uh, training part is uh, well taken care of. And uh, as far as attracting the youth is concerned, I think Coast Guard is fortunate. It's good to know that because, uh, you know, most people, uh, as I said, uh, seem to be 
slightly unaware of uh, what coast guard does and what what coast guard can uh, provide uh, to the nation's security how does it contribute so uh, thank you for your time vijay and uh, coast guard of course uh, should be in uh, the people's consciousness uh, more often uh, than it has been uh, so uh, thank you for your time and your insights coast guard must uh, uh, be uh, you know brought to the limelight and that is why this discussion Thank you, Nitin. I am sure in the years to come, Coast Guard will deliver on its statutory function and live up to its motto: "Vayam Rakshama" or "We Protect." I'm sure you will. And uh, thank you very much, as I said again, uh, for these insights. Thank you. Uh, so, viewers, that was uh, ADG uh, Vijay Safikar, former uh, Coast Guard officer who was at the apex of the organization, and giving us uh, the insights about how Coast Guard functions, what is its role. and uh, what coast guard can do uh, to protect uh, not only india's vast uh, eez economic exclusive economic zone in the maritime domain but also uh, the uh, prevention of smuggling as well as uh, human trafficking so um, go and watch uh, this uh, do watch uh, do keep giving us feedback you know where to reach us our social media handles are all visible and do keep watching uh, bharat shakti's uh, youtube channel i am nitin gokhale